Good afternoon. I am Donna Imhoff. I am the campus president of, of this campus, Allegheny Campus. And on behalf of the Community College of Allegheny County, I want to welcome all of you to the Robert M. Mill Lecture Series, which uh, Mr. Mill is one of CCAC's great alumni and great friends and a graduate of our first graduating class, though um, that was only last year. Um, but we're really glad to, um, most importantly, have this uh, honor of this lecture series on his behalf. Um, today we have the pleasure of hearing an incredible story um, of Wendell August Forge, which, of which I am a tremendous fan. Uh, we were just discussing the amount of time I spend on their website and <clears throat> my checkbook spends there. Um, but it's an incredible story, and so um, I'd like to recognize our speakers for today, which uh, includes Will Connect, the president of Wendell August Forge, Chris Keck, master craftsman of Wendell August Forge, and Dave Soltes, president of the Pittsburgh Penguins Foundation. So um, with that, it is my distinct honor and my pleasure to introduce to all of you the chairwoman of our Board of Trustees here at CCAC. Um, we are so fortunate to have her, Ms. Amy Kuntz. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Let me start by sharing my gratitude with all of those that have taken the time to make today possible, whether it was by planning and organizing the event or by agreeing to share your thoughts with us today, um, and especially to those of you that have come today to learn from our speakers. It's always a pleasure for me to welcome the audience to this event for several reasons. Um, it's a pleasure because, and you know my bias here, CCAC is one of the greatest resources that our community has, and any opportunity that we have to show it off to any group of people is a good one from my perspective. It's also a pleasure because I would argue that Pittsburgh's history of labor management relationships is so very unique and interesting um, that it would really be a crime not for us to learn about it, to learn from that history and to take it with us forward. Uh, and finally, it's a pleasure to introduce the namesake for today's event. Uh, I consider Bob Mill to be a CCAC champion, a role model for me as board chair, and a friend. So without further ado, let me introduce Bob Mill. Well, thank you, Amy. I appreciate that, those kind words. I'd like to do something before we get started. <clears throat> just bear with me for a little bit. I'd like for you all stand up for just one second. Okay, now we're going to play a little, uh, little game. If this is your first lecture in this series, please sit down. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs> if this is your second lecture, please sit down. Your third lecture? Fourth lecture. Ah, look at this guy. Five? Six? Seven? Eighth. Ah, oh, great. Wait a minute, who's the eighth? This is the eighth one. Yeah, it's the eighth one. Oh, wait, who was standing? Char Charlie, the two Charlies, and the staff in the back. Uh, there you go. Roseanne, Roseanne Nicola, make sure that you get credit cards from each one of them for the, their contribution. Thank you very much for being here, all those that you have attended. You honor me by your presence personally. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping, first of all, and, and welcome the members of the advisory committee. If you'd please stand up. Charlie Bloxage. Charlie just retired in a couple months ago from CCAC. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jackie Cavalier, the uh, in, endowed professor of the Robert and Mill Chair. Jackie. <laughs> Roseanne Nicola, who is our executive director. Roseanne. <laughs> She's executive director of the foundation. I, I, did I see John Zach? I thought I saw him come in. Uh, 
assistant professor. I thought he was Bill Flanagan, uh, executive VP, VP of uh, Corporate Relations, Allegheny County. Bob Howard, the executive director of Family House. And our consultant, Charlie McAllister. Sorry. I hope, I hope I didn't miss anybody. Did I? I don't think so. Oh, Mary Frances Archie. I apologize, Mary Frances. I, I knew I missed somebody. You know, I am very pleased today to, uh, two things. One is that I had the, the great honor of filling in for Leo Gerard, who couldn't be here today. And I know he wanted to be, particularly because of Will and Chris and what's been going on at the Wendell August Forge. And uh, he, he sends his apologies, and so I have this great honor to, to replace Leo Gerard. So I will go around for the rest of my life telling people I replaced Leo Gerard. <laughs> the second is to tell you about what's been going on here with the lecture series the Endowed Chair, and now the Institute. I've been telling you, those of you who've been around for a long time, I've been telling you that my goal was to one day get an educational program here at the college where we would have an accredited program that people who are active participants in the industry, on the labor side and on management side, would have the opportunity to come together in a classroom and study together and to forge relationships that will go on for a lifetime. When I got into this business 40 years ago, in the labor business, I knew nothing about labor relations. The only thing I knew about labor was that my grandfather was a stonemason and came from Scotland to start the union here. My dad was the executive director of two trade associations. And that was it. That's what I knew. And I want to tell you that all through those 40 years, and I look around the room and I see friends of mine from a long time ago, they put their arms around me and brought me in and taught me the business. And they were from labor side, and they were from management side. And now all these years later, I want to make sure that young people coming into this business in Western Pennsylvania have the same opportunity for the rest of the industry to put their arms around them, bring them here to this class, classes here at the, com at the community college, and to understand the unique labor and management relations that we have in this community. That's been my dream. I want to tell you that the dream has come true. Starting in January, the first class will start. The first cohort will start. A 13 class, uh, 13 session, first semester. We're really excited about it. We're going to have people from labor, people from management, learning from Jackie Cavalier as the, as the professor and representatives, practitioners from labor and management. Let me give you a little, some highlights of who those people will be. People like John Sermer, the retiring chairman of the board of uh, U.S. Steel. Jack Shea, the president of the Allegheny County Labor Council. Jack Ramage, the head of the, the uh, Master Builders Association. Dennis Yablonski and Bill Flanagan from the Allegheny Conference. Jim Kunz from the Operating Engineers. All of these people and many, many more will be in the classroom actually teaching those students. What an opportunity to cram it all into each session. They're very specific sessions. They will lecture in each one of them supporting Jackie. I am really excited about this. There's only one problem. We've got to recruit students. We want, it, we want the first cohort to be a minimum of 10 students from labor, 10 students from management. Today's the kickoff of that drive. We need to get those people together for that cohort to get started. Then, in fe back in uh, September of next year, the second cohort will start. And then it will continue after that. Now, the interesting thing about the cohort, not only will they, will they be in class together for all of those 13 classes, and a summer session where they'll do online work, they will have the opportunity to be together for the whole five semesters. You can leave that program, but nobody can get in. So that cohort will stay together. No, no interference after the first class. We're really excited about this. In the packet that was given to you, there is some uh, information about the program. There's also an application. And then there's also the ability to fill out an application online. If you have in your organization people who, are, who you think would be appropriate to put into this program, and we're thinking younger people who are just getting their feet wet in dealing with labor or in dealing with management would be the perfect candidates. So we hope that we can count on you 
to, to uh, participate, find us students. We've got one month to do this, and I know that we'll fill that class up pretty quickly. But we did it, and I thank a, a lot of the people here, particularly at the community college, for the, for the uh, efforts that they put in, Jackie, Charlie, Mary Frances, Archie, who, who ran the program through uh, governance here at the college. Wasn't an easy task, but we were able to do it. So uh, please look at the information in your packet, and uh, let's move on to the program. Now I'll pretend I'm Leo Gerard. I'd like to introduce to you uh, our first speaker of the, of the day. I knew the moment I spoke to Will Connect, he was a, a man of passion, not only about his business, but life as well. His exuberance is evident, as you will readily see today. Will is second generation of leadership at Wendell August Forge. His father, Bill, purchased the, the forge from the August family in 1978, and Will has spent half of his life working at the forge. Having learned the business from the ground up, he is perfectly suited for his current role as president of Wendell August Forge. He's proud of making products in the United States, and Will is also proud of the artisans that he has surrounding him that makes the forge someplace special. His biggest challenge to date was the devastating fire and the return to operation in record time. That event is the cornerstone of today's lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Will Connect. Next, I'd like to welcome Chris Keck. Chris is a six-year veteran of Wendell August Forge, where he admits to knowing nothing about the business when he started. And now he's a master craftsman. He manages a group of artisans at the Forge and is also the US Steelworkers representative on site. Chris has been able to make positive changes to the contract at the Forge and clearly understands and appreciates the value of good labor and management relations. In addition to all of that, he will begin college in January, majoring in business management. We also have a program here, Chris, that you might be interested in. <laughs> Consider yourself recruited. Please welcome Chris Kett. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Dave Soltes is a longtime member of the Pittsburgh Penguins senior management team. We first met during the construction phase of the Consol Energy Center in his previous role as the Senior Vice President of Sales. When the Pens won their last Stanley Cup, the players and apparently the staff had the opportunity to spend some precious time with the Stanley Cup alone. In my family, Dave Soltis is a hero because he took the, the Stanley Cup to my grandchildren's school for the day. This is the school where his grandchildren also go. <laughs> So it wasn't for me, trust me. And so I had these great pictures of my grandchildren standing next to the Stanley Cup. A valuable asset to the Pens, Dave was asked to start the Pittsburgh Penguin, Penguin Foundation, which is not the same as the Mario Lemieux Foundation. His major focus now is community outreach and charitable efforts. After the fire at Wendell August Forge, the Penguins had a role in its resurgence. He will tell us that story today. Please welcome Dave Soltis. All right, so let's get on with the show. Please uh, welcome to the podium, Will Connect. Will? Bob, I uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction and the invitation. It was pretty amazing when he, uh, he called and uh, he mentioned his name and then he mentioned the lecture series. I was quite in awe. Uh, of a man who, uh, at his young age, has a, a lecture series named after him, and uh, truly a great visionary for this region, and, and it's really a privilege to uh, be here today uh, at your namesake event and, and representing Wendell August. Uh, it truly is an honor for us, and there's one reason, and Chris and I have chatted about this and laughed about this, there's, there's really one reason we're here, and that's because we had a fire. <laughs> and that's a little bit unique to say and a little bit weird to say, but it is, it is true, and, and how true in life that when tough things happen or bad things happen, uh, the Lord has a way of turning those tough, tough challenges into the greatest opportunity. 
And that's really what we're here to talk about and, and what we're privileged to share. 2008, 2009, Wendell August was having a very challenging time financially, as many uh, companies were. In fact, our advisors told our family that it was maybe time to shut down the business, and not many people know that. Chris, you might not know that, but uh, <laughs> um, we made it, so. But uh, 2008 uh, told potentially shut down the business, and uh, we decided as a company that wasn't even uh, an option. Uh, we decided as a family that uh, being able to make something in America is not only a privilege, it's an honor, and it's something that we should steward. And so in 2009, we spent that year really restructuring the company. And probably some of y'all have been involved in restructuring of companies. It's never easy. It's never painless. Uh, actually, uh, quite a bit of pain. And unfortunately, some very, very good people had to move in another direction with their professional careers. But toward the end of 2009, we really felt that our mojo was coming back and that we were turning things around and and new opportunities were before us. We entered 2010 with incredible joy and incredible excitement about what was happening. And in early March, and it was a Thursday, and it was March 4th to be exact, we had the privilege of being invited into the office of the Pittsburgh Penguins and uh, to meet with a gentleman by the name of Dave Soltes and his entire marketing team uh, for the Penguins and the foundation and uh, to present an opportunity to uh, work uh, with Wendell August on, on tickets commemorating the last game at Mellon Arena. And uh, we left that meeting hopeful, but you know our palms were a little bit sweaty. Uh, my colleague at the time, he and I went to a, uh, it was a Chinese buffet in Cranberry, and we were having dinner when the fateful call came, I believe from Dave, you guys got the job. And it was going to be the largest job in the Wendell August history. To say that we were excited is, uh, that'd be an understatement. Uh, we went to work uh, the next day. Our grins were this big, high-fiving each other, brought the, you know, brought the entire employee base together. Uh, not only were we excited about the fact that it was the biggest job in our corporate history, but that we would be able to do it with, with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Or, I mean, that was huge uh, for us. So literally that afternoon, we got about the business of, of, of readying that order because I think we only had a little over four weeks to deliver it. And uh, cross-functionally, we got together the artisans and craftsmen. We got together and, and we plotted out a course to get us to, I think it was uh, early April, April 7th maybe, as, as that last game at Mellon. And um, we were so excited. Friday ended and, and we were just sky high. Saturday, the, 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 the day dawned beautifully, March 6th, but about one o'clock, I met one of our stores at the Grove City Outlet Mall, and I get, I get a call, and it's actually from Chris. Will, get back here. The forge is on fire. And I made my delivery to the store, and I picked up you know, what I was supposed to take back to uh, our, our, our business. And I'm getting to my car, and I get a second phone call from one of our colleagues. Will, the forge is burning. Get back here. So I got in my car, and I drove about the five miles to Grove City. And as I'm about three, four miles out, I see a huge plume of smoke and recognize that maybe this was a little bit more significant than I had, than I had originally thought it might be. And when, when we got there, it was pretty evident that it was a significant event. I had to park four or five blocks away. Uh, there were multiple fire departments uh, on the site, and it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, surreal. But it was kind of wild. I, I had this amazing peace about me uh, during this whole time. And as I walked up to the site, uh, there were employees who were seeking Chris out, seeking me out, seeking others out in tears. Because again, we'd just been, very, been through a very rough time from a co company standpoint, and people were naturally fearful for their jobs. Um, and, and people asked me, Will, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to feed my kids? And it became apparent that we needed to do something. And so at that moment, Chris and I and about 38 other people gathered around and, and we joined into a prayer circle. And I can remember the prayer very clearly. Lord, we don't understand what's going on. You do. We trust you. Just show us what you need us to do. Very simple, very quick. Literally, we broke that prayer circle and it was almost as if the lights were back on. And we got about the business of rebuilding our company. We had no option. 
There was no way we were going to disappoint this man who had just put so much trust in us for the Pittsburgh Penguins organization to give us the honor of that order. There was no way we were going to disappoint Dave Soltes. And, you know, March 4th, when we got that call, the biggest order in our history, how important it was to us, we had no idea how truly important it was. It was an entire rallying point for all 70 employees at Wendell August. We had a clear-cut vision. We had a clear-cut path, as daunting as it was, but we knew exactly what we needed to do. The day after the fire, I'm on the site with our insurance adjuster. He pulls me aside and he says, Will, I need you to prepare for being out of business for nine months. I'm like, not a chance. We can't be out of business for nine months. Here's what happened. Four, five days after the fire, our temporary workshop was up and running. Five days. And we had our first hammer event where we made our first ticket. It was incredible. Two weeks after the fire, our corporate offices opened. And four weeks after, we opened our temporary flagship store uh, in, in, uh, in space in Grove City. Truly miraculous. And I would suggest to you providential. I could tell you a hundred stories of the ways God worked in, in and through uh, that time. Preparing us for the fire during that time as we were recovering and then post-fire. Amazing, amazing stuff. But, but suffice it to say, Dave Soltes, did not, Dave Soltes did not realize how important he would be to a community. And the Pittsburgh Penguins, how important they would be to a community. Five days after a, a massive fire, destroyed everything. This wasn't just you know, a, a rebuild. This was destroying everything. We were back in business. And it, 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 it reached national press. The AP did a story. Fox News did a story. The New York Times did a story. And this little company that could and that we did. And as we recovered through that time, it was this, and, and, and my brother-in-law John and I were in a meeting this morning with our retail team in Grove City. And uh, one of, the, uh, uh, one of our, our, our colleagues was describing the pre-fire and post-fire, and she described it this way. Before the fire, we were a pretty close-knit group of people that worked together. But after the fire, we became a family. We became one. We knew we had each other's backs. We'd been through the trauma of 2009 together, and, and we knew that, 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 you know, as we recovered from this fire, we had each other's backs. You know, and as it relates to, to labor and management, you know, it, it you know, I, I don't know, I might not ever be invited back by Bob to a labor, labor management discussion because of what, what I'm about to say. But for me, there's no such thing as labor and management. It's we. You know, if we're involved in the same company, we're in it together. There, there's no way in this economic environment, in my humble perspective, and again, what do I know? I'm, I'm president of a small company in Grove City, PA. This is just you know, the way, the way I, I, I feel and look at things. But I don't look at Chris as, as labor, and I hope he doesn't look at, at me as, as manager. You know, there, there's a passage in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, and in my Bible it's highlighted, uh, the head, heading of it, it's called One Body and Many Parts. And that's really the way I see uh, the way we're trying to work together at Wendell August. We're one body. We're one company. We're literally fighting against competitors that are all made overseas. Uh, every one of our competitors in the metal giftware space is made in China or Mexico and in India. No one is left in America. And I don't say that with great pride. I wish all of our competitors were still in America. But a great company on the other side of the state, Wilton Armitau, about seven years ago, closed down their workshop. 250 American jobs lost overnight. And, and for us, we know that we're competing on the world stage. And to do that, we've got to be in it together. I look at Chris and his amazing talents, and I say, you know what? I am blessed to work with a guy with his talents. I don't have them. In fact, uh, when I was in college and I was working in the summer at Wendell August, I started off in the workshop. And this is a true story. About seven days after I started, uh, a couple of the, 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 my fellow craftsmen, I thought they were my fellow craftsmen, but a couple of the craftsmen went to our boss and said, you know, 
this Will guy's a nice guy and all, but he's got no skill. Where else can he go? And that's true. I have absolutely none of the skill set that Chris Keck has. But you know what? I'm not called to have that skill set. He has much of the skill set I have. There's some things that I'm able to do that maybe aren't in his wheelhouse. But guess what? That's okay. To me, our titles are meaningless. It's important to me that he's a master craftsman. It says a lot. Master craftsman. In this day and age, it says a lot. But to me, whether it's master craftsman or president, we're shoulder to shoulder. You know, his, his title is no bigger than mine. My title is no bigger than his. We march forward together. And that's the only way we're going to win. That's the only way, in my humble opinion, that we can take on Mexico, India, China, and, you know, slave labor or whatever it is they use, you know, the, the, the wages they pay, and beat them. We're not going to beat them in salary or wages. We're going to beat them right here. And if we look at each other confrontationally, it's not going to work. But if we understand that as a company, we're in this battle together, that whether you're a salesperson, you're a master craftsman, you're a vice president of operations, you're the president, CFO, titles are meaningless. What is the skill that you have been given? What is the talent God has blessed you with? And every day, each and every day, that we show up, it is my job to use those talents, use those gifts to, to the utmost of my ability and to be as excellent as I can possibly be. And I would ask, when I'm not excellent, I'm a jerk a lot. When I'm not excellent, I hope guys like Chris nudge me, poke me, and say, Will, you're off base here. That's how we win. The Wendell August story is a unique one. And again, anybody who knows me, 15 minutes is very difficult for me to speak for only 15 minutes. But I'm mindful of your time. The Wendell August story, it truly is miraculous. I mean, and again, it, it, I, I've lived it for these last three and a half years since the fire. But I've lived it almost as one of those folks who are in a movie but are like watching the movie. And that's the way I've sensed this opportunity the Lord has given me, is to watch a providential God working through amazing people. The great people I work with, the great people at the Pittsburgh Penguins who came alongside us. I've got one story to tell you. And the great people of western Pennsylvania. And we came together and we accomplished the miraculous. And in about two weeks, that chapter of our story closes because I'm, I'm really excited to say that in two weeks we finally open our new flagship and workshop and distribution facility in Grove City, about eight-tenths of a mile from the Grove City outlets, where folks will be able to tour again and see how the product is made and interact and, and see great things. So we're sort of... Madam President, at the end of one phase of our lives, and we're about to begin anew. But one story I want to tell you about Dave Soltes. And, you know, we were fully expecting on Sunday or Monday to get a call from the Penguins to say, you know what, well, thanks, but we're going to look in another direction. Last game at the arena is too important to it. We can't risk it. Not only did they not say that, Dave called us and said this. How can we help you? What do you need from us? There's no way we're going to pull this order. In fact, would it be helpful to you if we paid the entire amount of the order up front? Are you kidding? <laughs> and, and, and to close my portion of this, that doesn't happen every day. We are so blessed to be in this area, this region of the country, surrounded by great people like Bob Mill and Dave Soltes and all of you. And I, I, I just can't tell you how thankful I am every day to be able to show up to work with guys like my colleague who I'll invite up now, a true master craftsman, a colleague, but also a friend. Let me introduce to you Chris Keck. Saying how uh, honored and excited I am to be a 
chosen to, to do this. Uh, as you already know, uh, Will and I, we are, uh, we've worked well together for several years now. Um, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to repeat of some of the things that he's already said or else I would have nothing to talk about. <laughs> uh, my story might sound a little different than what his does, though. Uh, before the fire, it felt like I was just working at another job like I had in the past. It was just go to work, go home. You know, I had gained some relationships with some of my coworkers. Uh, but like I said, it was just another day at work when I was there. But... Uh, after the fire, something happened. Uh, I, w I was one of the guys that was worried about my family and, and my job. You know, I, I thought that it was over. So, to a sense, it was it was the end. But at the same time, it was a new beginning. And uh, we all rallied together, pulled together, and we said, "You know what? We're going to do this. This is going to work." Uh, we had already had the news that we had received this uh, penguins order. Um, but we knew we had a lot of work to do in order to fulfill this order, which we all did, were determined that this was going to happen. Uh, so some of the things that we had to do, while worrisome on whether we were gonna be able to complete this, uh, we had to uh, assess all of the dyes that had gone through the fire. We were not sure on any of them or whether they were gonna be good due to the heat that they had been through and, and some of them were damaged and ruined. But fortunately, there was enough that we were able to save to where we were able to continue with business as well as the Pittsburgh Penguins order. Uh, fortunately, uh, some of the, the unneeded equipment, I shouldn't really say it was unneeded, it was just that we didn't have room to put it in the uh, the old shop that we were functioning out of, uh, it was still in the, the vacant building that we had uh, worked out of prior to moving back to the, the building we were at when the fire occurred. Uh, the owner of that building had given us the opportunity to, uh, you know, take the building back and it worked out perfect because some of the, mach the machinery was still there, at least what we had left. It was still there, and we all huddled together, uh, at getting it back together to where it was functional. Um, I still remember the day that we had that die cut, and we hammered the first ticket off of it, hand hammered actually, which they all didn't turn out to be hand hammered, but uh, it certainly was something and meant something to all of us. Uh, you know, luckily there was other community members who was willing to help us as well. Uh, there was a Slovak store um, out towards the factory outlets that had uh, gotten together with Will and you know gave him the, the opportunity for us to go out there and work with them and, and have that be our temporary flagship store. Um, just the community in general was a huge help. Uh, I think every day we were there working to get things back together some business uh, from somewhere brought us lunch every day. I mean, it was amazing. I, I did, I've lived in Grove City my whole life, but I didn't know, you know, it, what, what we had, you know. And it's not just that, you know, what had happened, but I also say that that was because Grove City knows what kind of family the ownership of Wendell's Forge is. Uh, they're a great family. I enjoy working with Will. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, I, it just seems like over the last three and a half years, we've become family. And uh, there's a lot of new faces around. You know, before the fire, we had, actually, I was the lowest guy, and I was uh, number 14. So we had 14 craftsmen in the shop at the time. And now I think we have around 36 because of the hard work that everyone has contributed to the business and it's grown. Uh, I think, you know, talking with Will the other day, even beyond his wildest imaginations, in 2009, no one ever imagined to happen what, what we're going through today. Um, you know, we're very excited. You know, it, it's kind of like, it's not a tragedy this time, 
but we are still all working together to prepare for the move. Uh, three and a half years later, uh, we, we're, you know, we're gonna be working out of our new facility, which is beautiful. Uh, October 29th, you all will have to come and see. But uh, once again, I just wanna say how uh, excited I am and looking forward to continuing working with this great family. Um, and with that being said, I would like to introduce Dave Soltes. Excuse my voice, um, a little raspy today. Um, and thank you, Chris. Uh, great story. I'd like to acknowledge Bob Bill, his work in fostering a positive labor environment between labor and management. I think uh, the commitment that he's made to the community college here is is tremendous and it's uh, long overdue. So uh, Bob, uh, thank you for everything that you do. The other thing I want to tell you on a personal note, I still have four grandkids in St. Killian's and when we get the Stanley Cup this year, it's obviously going back to St. Killian's. So you can start prepping your, your grandkids and everyone else for it. I just started to prepare for this discussion. I'm trying to get a little bit of history. So I went to the, the website to see if I could pull out a paragraph that kind of you know, encapsulated what this was about. And excuse me while I read it to you. It says, a labor management discussion embodies a series of interactive sessions designed to foster a sustained dialogue on economic development issues facing the region by bringing together members of labor and management to share the perspectives and expertise. That's a powerful statement. But something's missing. And I'm sitting here thinking, something's missing. What's missing here? Okay? And I think that's what I bring here today. What's missing is the end user, is the customer. Sometimes when we talk labor and management, we kind of deal in a vacuum. And we understand what our issues are, collective issues, but whatever we are, I understand labor and management is in a fishbowl. Okay? And your customers or your end users look at you and say, do I want to do business with that company? You know, the way they act or their, their corporate responsibility or those type of things. So I go back and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to tell you, you know, uh, the genesis of what we look for in a, in a partner, okay? And then go back and tell you, you know, how Wendell August Forge kind of fit that bill. We want a partner that has a, 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 degree, a degree of creativity. It's really important, you know? If you know anything about the Penguins organization, you know, we want to be the first at what we do and the best at what we do, you know. That's from David Morehouse, Ron Burkle, Mary on down. That's, that's our charge. We're looking for unique product and services. We don't want to be a me too. So what can we put out there? What can we do? When the longest forge? No one was doing what we were doing. Sales support. I need somebody that's a great communicator. In our case, we had a sales guy by the name of Christian Warner, unbelievable communicator. And guess what? Everyone in Wendlogus Forge that we dealt with, I knew them by name, and he identified them by name, whether it be Chris or Aaron, whoever it was. So the, the, the organization started to take a personality for me as a customer. It's important to see if the, if the, the people in the organization you know, is that labor relationship, is it a strife labor relation? Last thing I need to do is do a promotion and all of a sudden there's some labor difficulty. You know, pride. Does this organization take pride in what they do? You know, can you sense that pride? You know, you just don't ask the question. It's in conversations. Is it American made? And then the most important thing that we lose sight of day to day is that the reason we buy a hat from overseas is price. Price is not what we're looking for. We're looking for value. And, and if you get into a price and value discussion, you understand what I mean. So the value of, of a relationship or a product from when long ago forge, you know, a, a product can be 50 cents cheaper from overseas, but the value of having that product from this company made the way it is, you know, gives us the value that we're looking for. And then the last thing I, I, when I, when I start to look at these programs is I said, would I recommend this to my friends? Is this a strong enough idea or program that I would step up and say, hey, you need to look at that. 
So let's go back and, and just talk a little bit about that. I have some visual aids here. So this is unbelievable what happened. So I started to look, this is the ornament. This is what, you know, the whole conversation is about. This is what Wendell August Forge put together. Understand that the task we gave them when we placed the order on March 4th was not a reasonable ask, okay? In, in four weeks, in four weeks, they had to have this product ready to ship to us, okay? I had a, a former boss and I had a problem about three years ago when I was on the business side and a promotion was running late. He said to me, Dave, in the history of this organization, we've never missed a promotion, okay? So was I a little bit worried? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> not much. So here's, here's the crazy part, you know, you know, call it karma, call it whatever you want. So when I, I went home and I pulled this, this piece out because I wanted to bring it, okay? So if you're not familiar with Wendell August, almost every piece is unique. It's the hammer and edge, okay? And each of the craftsmen has his own symbol that they actually punch on the back of this. Randomly, I went home, got this out of the cupboard, pulled it out, and guess who the craftsman was that hammered this piece? It, it gets even crazier, and this goes into the creativity of it. When I couldn't find one in the office, that's why I went home and got it. But I, I had some copper ones that we had made, okay? So I grab a copper one out of the out of the out of the out of the cupboard, you know, and I'm looking at it. Guess who hammered that one? Chris. I think he was the only one hammering at that time. So. so but understand that that you know, we start to talk about things that you look in, in organizations. You know, this isn't just a hammered piece, you know, that they presented to us. There was a second part to this. Here's what they offered to do. Okay, you're a season ticket holder. It's your last game at Mellon Arena. If you went to the Forge in Grove City, they would literally hand hammer your ticket number in here. Okay? So it's that creativity, it's that extra step, it's that uniqueness, it's that value. You know, this is probably one of the strongest dollars we invested in the promotion. Okay? 25,000 units. They didn't stop there with that promotion. They came back and said, hey, Dave, here's an idea for you. You know, we know you spent a lot of money. Maybe here's a way you can recoup some of it. So we started to hammer, I think, 1,000. I'll tell you in a minute. Yes, we hammered 1,000 of copper for sale. We sold these for $149, okay? So the, the, the Penguins organization was able to recoup some of their investment. Uniqueness about it, each is hand hammered by a craftsman. Each has one of a thousand, two of a thousand on the back. So it wasn't just, you know, here's a product, go sell it, thank you for your order. It was, they tried to understand our business and how to help us in our business. Sales support. Um, again, it was an unreasonable offer to ask. I mean, I, you have to understand to do what they do for 25,000 pieces in a four week period, you know, and then to have a fire on top of that, it's amazing. So the story goes on. Uh, when I was on the business side, now in 2010, I'm asked to 2000, late 2010, uh, to start a foundation. So they come in with a wild idea. Why don't we do something with the roof? Sure, what do you want to do with the roof? Okay, we'll make ornaments out of the roof. Okay, so that, that's this, okay. We were doing very well as a foundation. We had strong support, a lot of money to do different programs and that. This particular promotion, in 18 days, they hammered 84,000 ornaments, okay? And it realized $2.2 .2 million in gross sales, about which half of went to the foundation, okay? So it's, you know, Christian man, you know the saying, you know, thousandfold it comes back to you. The investment that we made up front, the offer to pay, to front the cash, to win Lugus Forge, you know, came back to us in full return. What are we able to do with these monies, okay? You know, we have free equipment that we put into schools, you know, uh, concussion, baseline concussion testing programs. Um, pride, it, it's evident, to hear Will and Chris talk, it's evident they have pride in what they do, okay? The other quality, American made, there's no doubt that it's American made. It's unique, you know, you can't find another piece like it. And value, you know, 
is there value in Red Lotus products? So the, the big barometer here is, you know, well, okay, they did a nice job for us. What would I do? Would I recommend that to our friends? So what's happened since then? The Winter Classic, the NHL, actually they did tickets for the Winter Classic for the NHL, aside from the Penguins. The Mario Lemieux Foundation, they did a custom plate for his uh, fundraising event at Nemecon, raised over $200,000 for the Lemieux Foundation. Obviously, Mario signed it, which made it a little bit more valuable, okay? Um, they just keep continuing to give and give and give. Two years ago, you know, I'm on the Ireland Fund Committee, and uh, we were honoring Leo Girard, okay? And it came up, you know, what would be appropriate as a parting gift, you know, for the guest? I said, why don't we do the ticket? Why don't we make the ticket? Nothing better than have United Steel workers hammering the ticket, made out of steel, okay? And it was unbelievable, the response. Year two came back. David Malone's being honored by the American Ireland Fund. They come up with an idea of actually producing a shamrock and a bronze. Wasn't, yeah, it was shamrock, right? Shamrock? Yeah. Shamrock and bronze. And each of the guests left with that. So the, the, the whole story boils down to, you know, March 4th, you know, we made a solid decision, you know, and we didn't take it lightly when we made the decision to do business with Wendell August Forge. For us, it was, it was, uh, it was breaking the mold, it was doing something different. A lot of research, we touched and felt the people in the organization felt very comfortable with what they were doing. March 7th was the day that, uh, you know, holy mackerel, what do I do, okay? The easiest thing to me when I'm watching the news on Saturday and, and really quite easy to say, hey, listen, and everyone would have understood. We just can't do it. You know, there was a fire burned to the ground. What do you expect? But that wasn't it. It was, it was we felt a corporate responsibility, you know, to help in any way we could. That's our organization, okay? It's not me. It's not Dave Soltis. It's our organization. We felt a corporate responsibility. And that's where the questions came. Can you do it? and our belief in their ability to do it, okay? So that's what it was all about. So although the 27th, I'm sorry, March 7th was a uh, unfortunate day and, you know, uh, scared the heck out of me when I saw it because, you know, you go through that, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Uh, it worked out for the best. I just wanna say thank you for one August. We've done it, we've done a lot of references to various corporations about doing projects with them. I would highly recommend, if anyone's considering anything promotionally, award-wise, no, this isn't a commercial. This is my, my heart talking, that you really strongly consider one of the longest fortune. This time, <laughs> Joe. Thank you, Dave. It's not a great story or what. It's just really amazing. And one of these things you only hear in Western Pennsylvania, I think, especially the labor management component of this. My name is Bill Flanagan. I, I'm with the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, serve on the advisory uh, co committee for this initiative. But I think the reason they had me come up to do this part is because of my part-time job as host of our region's business on WPXI on Sunday morning. So I'm here to facilitate the Q&A and make sure we move this along and get everybody to the reception after the, after the program on time. Now the way this works, everybody should have a card. We passed out cards, you should be in the folders and whatever. If you have a question, feel free to jot it down. We'll have folks running through the room and, uh, or walking through the room or whatever. Uh, and they'll pick them up and bring them up here to me and then uh, I'll be able to ask our panelists the questions. I've got one to get started while you all are thinking and, and, and writing. And I guess that, you know, the question is you talked a little bit about sort of the dark times, uh, which I guess sort of coincided with the Great Recession and the onset of the economic calamity the world faced five years ago. So, uh, but I, I guess my question, what was labor re management relationships like at Wendell August Forge before the recession, before the cutbacks, and, and before the fire? First, is this, uh, yeah. do I need to turn this yeah. on? Yeah, you're up. Am I on? Yeah. All right. Um, I think it was good. Uh, it wasn't uh, great. It was good. And, and just evidence, and I'll, I'll give you an evidence of, of it being good. Um, when we had to make the tough decisions in 2009, uh, we got together um, and, uh, and, and talked about how we were going to, uh, to
to make some, uh, some tough choices. And um, we worked together and we came up with a great solution that you know, I, I never would have thought of. And, and actually where the, that solution came from was from the craftsman. And um, you know, we, we had a couple of ideas and, 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 and threw them out to, to, to the team. And uh, they said, hey, Will, do you mind stepping out for a little bit? Let us talk through this. And uh, about 10 minutes later, they called us back. And uh, they had come up with a, a phenomenal solution in terms of rather than significant deep layoffs that would have hurt a lot of people. Uh, instead, what we did was uh, we rotated one week off, one week on. So half of the craftsmen would work one week, and half, the other half would work the next week. And it was a brilliant solution for the company. It reduced the, the operating costs that we needed to reduce, while at the same time it was helpful for our craftsmen because it allowed them to participate uh, with unemployment in the interim time periods. And so I, I would suggest it was, it was good, uh, it was respectful. Um, but I think, again, as Chris said, uh, post-fire, it just changed. It turned to, to another degree uh, where it is, we've got each other's back, we're in this together. And um, so I think it went from, you know, the popular uh, Jim Collins book, Good to Great, uh, it went from good to great. Not, not Bill without its problems. Uh, again, many of those problems uh, come with uh, me getting out of my lane a little bit and, and, and not using my skill set correctly um, or trying to do things that aren't in my skill set. So we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, one of our objectives is to be, in the next 10 years, named one of the top 100 places to work in America. Mm -hmm. You know, we're far from it now, but we've set that as a 10-year goal in 2023. And uh, we, we aim to do that. Well, Chris, I want to go back to that idea that, of, of what the craftsman came up with is sort of two weeks on, two weeks off. There had to be a significant sense of trust on the part of labor with the management of that company to be able to have that conversation and come up with that creative solution. Is that part of what made it possible to figure that out at the time? Uh, absolutely. Um, everybody that works at Wendell August, even there's guys that's been there for 25 to 30 years right now and they all know, you know about the Connect family. It, this isn't anything new. This isn't anything that happened after the fire. This has always been a great family. And we knew what we were dealing with and we knew that they would try to help us out in any way that they could. So if they were being honest with you about the circumstance that the company faced, the, the, the union was willing to figure this out and work with them. But Will describes it as a light switch being flipped when the fire happened and everybody came together. So from your standpoint, what really changed in that moment? How, how, how did the relationship, I guess, go from good to great? can't speak for everyone, but for myself, it was just, it showed me uh, just, you know, what this family was, was willing to do. And, you know, as Will said, it's, it's just not family, it's what God has, has worked in our lives. Um, it's just, it's, you know, to, I guess to agree, it's unexplainable for me to, uh, explain what happened it's just once again this is a great family and I know that they would do anything that they could to help not just myself but anybody that works there hmm. hey, Chris a couple of quick questions for you from the audience one is are you a working union rep I mean what what's your involvement with the union what's your relationship when you have to sit down across the table from this guy and negotiate <laughs> How, what's yeah, your role? I, I'm a working union rep and uh, I've, I've negotiated a couple of contracts with Will, and uh, we haven't agreed on a lot of things, you know, but in the end, I think we both win. I am. That's an interesting point. Um, Chris is an extremely intelligent guy, and he gets it. I mean, Chris just gets it. And uh, we've had very intense fellowship uh, together uh, as we have uh, negotiated contracts, and. Chris knows what is needed and he's not going to back down. But I think, you know, there's a mutual respect that we have for each other and, and for each other in the organization that makes that working rep, 
you know, we don't cross the boundary. I, I, I would never expect him to do anything that not, is not in the best interest of everybody. Um, and I'm not looking to him f for him to tilt the, 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 the tide to the, the ownership group at all. I, I respect his mind and his ability to think and his desire and, and I mean, he'll bring the, the hammer. <laughs> I, I can remember some of the negotiating stand, you know, sessions that we had that were quite heated. But at the end of the day, we'd walk out and buy each other a coffee and, and say, hey, I'll see you in church Sunday. <laughs> you know? and, and, and that's a mutual respect that, that's unique in his perspective. And, and it's just what a blessing to be able to, to deal with that kind of guy. Knows what he needs, is adamant in terms of where he, how he represents his team. But at the end of the day, we can walk out arm in arm and say, let's go. Yeah, Chris, another question from the audience. Um, you know, and as the company has strengthened and survived the fire, th thanks and so, so much for the, uh, the Penguins for standing behind it. You know, ha has the union contract improved? You mentioned there are a lot more craftsmen working there today. Do you feel like you're making progress and the, and, and the contract with the company's gotten better over the last several years? Uh, yeah, it's gotten better. Um, there's a lot of new guys in the shop. Um, a lot of them I've tried to coach uh, and, and try to make them understand my thought process. Uh, you know, working with some of these guys, uh, I understand that um, we're all different. You know, so, some of us think that everything should be handed to us, and, and you know, the family at, at times I wonder if they think that the family should make any money, that it should be just about us. <laughs> And I have to remind them that that's not how it is and it can't be that way or else next time, you know, we won't be working a week on, a week off. We'll be off, you know, and I need to make them understand that still the economy is not great, you know, and any day something could happen. And I try to make these guys understand we need to make this company as much money as they can because look what they've done for us. It's not fair that we're the only ones winning. You know, we, we, we need to win together. Yeah, and, well, and Will, Will and I both understand that. You know, as Will mentioned, you're like the last one standing in, in your industry in the United States of America. That, that has to say something right there. A uh, question for the Penguins. Uh, and this is from a, a, one of our audience members who admits to not being a Penguins fan, as hard as that is to believe, but we know there are a few out there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> But at any rate, they really want to see you talk about promotion. What is it exactly that you were doing? You talked about the tickets. How does a promotion work? And, you know, what were you asking the, the Forge to do? And why was it such a big deal to do it within four weeks? Well, it, it was tough making a decision. You, you have to understand that there was a tremendous, tremendous history at the Mellon Arena. Uh, not only from a hockey standpoint, the Stanley Cups that were won there. Uh, but concerts, you know, whether it been the Beatles or, or presidents that have performed there. So it, it was about, it was about honoring the, the grand old building going down. And what better way to do it with a, with a handcrafted product? You know, um, we're about, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. I can't give the exact number. We're on about close to 300 sellouts, you know, consecutive sellouts. We're very, very fortunate to have a very loyal, uh, you know, season ticket holder group and a very loyal following. And we don't take that for granted, you know, as, you know, Will and, and Chris and their business, we don't take that for granted. So it's important when we have that opportunity to do something different and unique promotionally that lets them as a season ticket holder, you know, oh man, that's really cool. I remember when I did this in that particular building. That's kind of the process or that's why we selected it. If you look at it traditionally from a cost standpoint, much, much more expensive than something promotionally we we do in the building. This but is the stuff you hand out at games, right? I show up, I come to a game and get a shirt, come to a, free, get a towel, right? Yeah. This is a free souvenir for yeah. the closing of the old building, right? If it was on the website of Wendlogs, it had been a $30 and okay. they, they would retail it for. So, it but, so you guys don't like sit down the summer before the season and map all this out and you've got it all, it's just like a month before you're gonna need the tickets. Yeah, we uh, treat <laughs> <laughs> No, we traditionally, you know, we traditionally map everything out, but we, you know, that was, it was indescribable, that was the last event in the building. So it wasn't as if you wanted to, to say, here's what we're doing, it's almost like you wanted to take an extensive amount of, 
time planning and make sure you put when to August on pressure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the best work out of them, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's how it came about. So it was kind of a late coming decision. You're getting close now, the game's getting closer and closer. You have this brainstorm, and then it's who can deliver it in that period of time. Well, the, the other daunting task that we, you know, I have to mention that the 84,000 ornaments that they produced for us, they did it in 18 days. Wow, 84,000 in 18 days? 18 days. How'd you do it? <laughs> no one slept. No one slept. But I think I posted the, the labor management. There had to be requests for overtime. Hey, would you guys work? I mean, I, I think you had a labor group that saw the opportunity for the forge to take the next step, and they recognized it. And I'm sure that there were some, some conversations back and forth between Chris and, and Will. You know, hey, we need this. Can you help us here? You know, I mean, some of these guys, I mean, they had to be, you know, I had stories of these guys, their hands were just, right? Yeah, the wrist. Wow, the stamping. Just from, uh, yeah, well, how about that? You know, he, he comes in with an order. Will's got another great idea. 84,000 guys are going <laughs> to deliver this in days. How do you work that out? That's a huge opportunity. But in a lot of labor management relations, it can be, yes, yeah, you know, that's a lot of extra work. I want to go fishing. I want to go do whatever. So how do you guys work through that and sort of join hands and, and, and make it happen and deliver for the customer? Uh, fortunately for the company, a lot of these new guys that work there are younger and they have families and they want to make as much money as they can. I'm one of those guys. <laughs> okay. so that's why your name's on all the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not working, it's because I wasn't allowed, really. I mean, I have three kids with my wife and uh, I, I work as hard as I can for my family, just as my wife does as well. But. Uh, there's a lot of hard workers in there, and they all want to make money. Not even a question. I mean, it wasn't anything where anybody had to come begging. We, we really saw what a blessing it was. We, we remembered the fact that a year prior, we almost went out of business. And again, just an incredible tribute to the people that I'm blessed to work with and the craftsmen. It, was, it wasn't an issue. Or, you know, the team in distribution, the same thing. Incredible hours. When I say we were working around the clock seven days a week, it's true. It's true. Hmm. I mean, just amazing people. What a dedication. And for us, you know, we're making it in America, and that means something. And I think that's a little bit behind all that we do. There's a pride in the fact that we're the last man standing. And, you know, we bleed red, white, and blue, and, and, and we're going to go the extra mile. And again, it's not me, it's, it's, it's everybody living it every day. You know, it's interesting. We say a lot about the, the sort of the Pittsburgh economic transformation over the last 30 years. We get these groups in from all over the country asking what happened here. How did you do it? And we say, well, we had a crisis in the 80s, the collapse of heavy industry. And if you have a crisis, you know, you, you get yourselves organized. You work together, even if you have disagreements, you know, politically, organizationally, whatever, and you get the job done. But then the question they always come back to us with is, well, what are you going to do now that you don't have a crisis? You know, how do you sustain this? How do you continue to work together? How do you keep this front and center? So, all right, the fire's beyond. You're going to open the new facility in a couple of weeks. How do you keep this same sense, uh, uh, this same commitment to work together? And are you concerned about that? as time goes by. You know, obviously we'll have our issues and we'll, we'll, we'll hit speed bumps for sure, but you know, I think our job is to create, cast a vision that's bigger than ourselves and then work to achieve that vision together. And, um, you know, we just, you know, instituted an incentive plan for the craftsmen that, uh, you know, as we go above and beyond, uh, there's a share. The company shares and the craftsmen share in those gains that they make. And that's the, that's the, you know, the, the, the way we want to move forward. We're in it together. We cast a vision and then we go after it together. And we have a very, very you know, we're a small company, Bill, and you know you and I have spent time together. Um, we're a small company, but we have recognized exactly what you said. We've cast a big vision. You know, in 10 years, 2023 will be our 100th anniversary as a company, which, you know, says something in and of itself. But, you know, our desire is to be one of the 100 best places to work with one of the 100 best brands and, and small middle brand. We're not going to compete with Google, but one of the 100 best places to work, one of the 100 best 
uh, brands and doing 100 million in sales. That's a big challenge and that's a big, big out there for us. And so that's what we've done. We've put that out there and now it's our job to work together to achieve it and in doing so, share the benefit with all of us. I mean, this, you know, I'm not Vladimir Putin, so I'm not, I'm not speaking socialism here, but we all need to be chasing the same objective. We know by satisfying our customers and creating something special, we can achieve those goals. And um, so that, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but we've put a big goal out there with our customer focus in mind. And now we lay the game plan together and we move forward. Is that a big part of it, Chris, kind of buying into that vision, having management that can really express that uh, to, to, to everybody who works with the company? Uh, yeah, I, being a representative, I understand it's crucial that I have maintained, and this is not why I have a relationship with Will, but I know that it's, it's, it's very important, you know, it, it, as a leader, of, of the union and the guys on the shop, it's important that I somehow find a way to maintain a good relationship with the company because that's how we win. If I go in there and, and I can't get along with Will, he's not going to get along with me and it's not going to work. So uh, I understand that too. And to having the role that I have, it's important that I, I, I explain myself to the guys working with me as well because you know I can't do it by myself. Yeah, I have a question from the audience about just how, how the two of you resolve issues on a daily basis that might come up. These aren't the big things that would undermine the company but issues come up so how do you work through them and is there an example of a, of a problem that you two were able to resolve you know in recent history the, the, sort of the bumps in the road you run into in, in running any business? I start and then you finish on that one? Sure. A great example is that incentive plan. And again, Chris was relentless. I mean, in a good way. He wouldn't let that fall off the radar. We had talked about it in negotiations and because of all the change we were getting to, we didn't get a chance to execute it as quickly as we could have or we should have. But this guy was relentless. And, and again, we're a small company, so you know, we see each other every day, everywhere. And um, so as we rub shoulders with each other and as we pass each other, and we typically see each other every day, um, and, and uh, you know, our, our, our Vice President of Operations, Chuck Ertzberger, who's here, is now moved into more of a, of a, of a, of a direct communication role. Um, but I think uh, he exhibits that same desire to work together, and we just deal with things face, face on. You know, we don't have anything hidden under the thing. If he's got an issue, he's going to bring it to us. And he'll do it and do it and do it. And uh, if we've got an issue, it's the same thing. There's no fear, I guess. Uh, there's no, oh gosh, what's he going to say? I don't want to bring this. Again, it, it, it comes back to that basic level of trust. And I'm not going to get my way all the time. I get that. My way is not always the best way. I'm definitely understanding that. And that's the way we deal with it. Hey, here's something we got to talk about. And we talk about it, and we come to what's in the best interest of the 110 people that we work with. And that's really, I think, what we try to come out with. Uh, here's an example. In 2012, I uh, negotiated the, our latest contract with Will. And in one of our proposals, we wanted, uh, they were trying to alter the, the health care in, in the uh, contract as well as, you know, when you're negotiating a contract, you always go for more than you think you're going to get. So, for our raises, we went at them with like a dollar twenty-five an hour over every year for three years. I think it was the maddest I've ever seen Will ever. <laughs> it's like it was so funny. I still joke around about this, but even with my coworkers, because he's telling me the importance of keeping this company in America. And as you all have heard him talk about today, how he's, we all believe that it's important, you know, for, for everyone. And uh, five minutes later, I'm telling him, showing him this offer, $1.25 an hour for the next three years. You know, we want you to pay for our health care. Forget it. 
We'll ju- I'll just take it to China. I'll make the phone call now. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I said jerk? <laughs> Have a dose of realism from the, from the labor standpoint as well. And one thing you mentioned that I thought was really interesting at the beginning of your remarks, and it was the idea of that we talk about labor and management uh, and we sort of leave the customer out of the equation, like somehow these guys can battle it out inside their company and at the end of the day there's not a customer making a decision about whether to deal with the company. I just wonder, you talked a lot about the values and the nature of the partners that Penguins like to work with. Why is that so important to the organization? Because you could do it on straight bottom line. What's the cheapest thing I can get that's going to satisfy my fans? But it sounds like you've made your own cultural commitment and organizational commitment as a business to do business a certain way. Where does that? Where did that arise, and how did it make these guys really valuable partners? I'd like to say that comes top down. You know, uh, fortunate enough, I've been with the organization now 16 years, with a diverse group of owners uh, through that period of time, as you can appreciate. And uh, that's really, you know, Mario started with, with his foundation. You know, talk about corporate responsibility. Um, and y- you know what? We just, you know, when we have an opportunity, I'll give you an example, uh, which I didn't show that's up there. Uh, we were up against the gun just recently. We had a 6.6K run that we did with the Mary Lou Lemieux Foundation. We did as a collective, okay? I knew, I knew that if I went to Wendell August on a short lead time, they would provide me with artwork. They would, they would do everything in their power to get done. So when you start talking about a quarter here, a dime here, on a promotional item, a bottom line, it's invaluable when, when you're up against it. You know that you have a partner or a business relationship that will react, you know, over and above how they need to react. You know, again, the lead time was terrible on the uh, on the Mary. We put the whole race together. Don't tell everybody this in six weeks. You know, we had more runners than the Steelers had in there, so it talks a l- little bit about the popularity of the franchise. And all. But to have the ability to go to someone, and we have other partners like that, to go and say, hey, Will, I need this medal in this period. Can you do it? And you know what? It's never, oh, let me see. It's, we'll figure out how we can do it. Hmm. You know, and it's, you know, with the dedication of folks like Chris and the organization, that things, these things happen. Just that comfort level. They're going to step up and do the job. A couple of just sort of practical questions from the audience, I guess. When did Wendell August Forge become a union shop? It's United Steelworkers, right? 80 or 81? 80 or 81. Somewhere, somewhere yeah. So back right around the... T- 80, somewhere in the 79 to 81. Okay. Uh, my mom's here, and I can say this. Uh, <laughs> my dad and mom bought the company in 19... My mom's here, by the way. It's kind of... She's a great lady. She's right there. She, <laughs> um, so uh, when, when they bought the company, my dad came over from IBM, and this is an interesting story. He was a sales and marketing guy. He wasn't per se a, a manufacturing guy. And uh, looking back, I totally get why the union came in. And you know, no disrespect to my dad, I get it. And uh, it's neat how it's evolved over the years. Uh, into uh, a relationship that uh, we work together and we work toward a common goal. But uh, it came in in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and there was a reason for it. And uh, hopefully that uh, now we, we've, we've worked together in, in a different light, but with the same objectives moving down the road. So that the relationship has matured over that generation from the early 80s in terms of how you work I, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and another uh, another question just has to do with the fire. Just curiosity, I guess. W- was anything salvageable at the old site where you had the fire? This is from somebody who actually went to Grove City College and used to go to the old site, I guess, to buy things. Yeah. And um, really, the two two key aspects of Wendell August: one are our people, and two are the dyes that our artisans create the the actual original designs and they're engraved into steel, you know, one inch thick steel. And um, we have about, I don't know, 4,000 dyes. They're the lifeblood, you know, outside of our people, the lifeblood of our company. And we were able to salvage, if you can believe this, Bill, all but 70 or 72. Mm. And so it was miraculous. And again, if any of you all are firefighters or no firefighters, the night of the fire, 
we had we had 21 fire uh, volunteer fire departments respond to the fire, and the night of the fire, remember this we we had the line of the firefighters that went into the building as it was still burning, and they made a, a two by two rows, you know, 40 people deep or how many, and they were in the dye vault handing the dyes out, and they got as many as I mean heroic. And then the next day, literally that next day, our craftsmen were digging in the rubble, trying to find as many of the dyes as we possibly could. And so again, just heroic effort of the firefighters and our craftsmen the days after, um, we were able to, to, to you know, keep our, our key asset. Um, but outside of that, there was very little at all that we were able to, uh, to you know, save. Um, now Chris mentioned there was another piece of machinery in an old building that you were able to move back into that kind of got you up and running fast, is that? We have a facility that we're actually currently still working out of. Um, when I started working for Wendell August in 2007, that's where I started working. And it was like a satellite location to the original business that you were using? Was that, yeah. How long had, did you guys work out of that building before me? It was, it was a while. Again, I talk about the providential nature of this story. Probably the stupidest decision I've ever made as, as, as the president of the company was, I don't know, 2002 or whenever it was, that we moved our manufacturing out of our historic, you know, national register building, and we moved it down the street a half mile. If you'd asked me, I, I couldn't even tell you why I even made that. I mean, it's dumb. <laughs> and, uh, um, but again, God knew that, that in 2010, that decision would be needed because that building was the reason we were able to get back up and going. We had vacated it in 2009. So we had moved out of that building in 2009, moved back to our historic building that has since burned. Uh, however, the landlord was unable to lease any of the space. Literally, the electrical, the, you know, some of the old equipment, as Chris mentioned, was still in this building. Are you kidding me? I mean, without that building, there is no way we could have done the order. There's no way we could have gotten back in. It was wired for us, ready to go. And so, you know, what we do sometimes foolishly can be turned into something really great. And, and I look back and still the dumbest decision I've ever made, but one that we were able to utilize in the go forward. So we were there for about seven, eight years. A remarkable story. Well, another question from the audience. So how have sales been since the fire? And do you think all the publicity, you said you went national on the publicity, has that helped? Has it actually helped in some ways to build the Wendell August brand? It really has, yeah. Again, I mean, we had a, a month before the fire, we had hired a PR agent. First time in our life we had a PR firm working for us. You know, just amazing the, the things that line up. So as the fire is, is burning and Chris and colleagues are, are, are telling the firefighters where to go to get stuff or, you know, do this, I'm on my BlackBerry at the time with our PR uh, firm, and we're writing a press release about the fire so people you know, know that we're still in business. And that, that press release was picked up internationally. And, and it really, and then uh, through the Penguins and Dave championing us, you know how you, you, you sometimes have corporate ambassadors? This guy's an ambassador. He's opened so many doors for us in so many different ways. So yes, sales have, have almost doubled. Uh, since the fire and, and, and while we're dealing with all this other stuff going on and, uh, and, and you know we're now selling uh, it forced us to think differently totally differently is when you have nothing you think totally different um, currently we're in over 800 retail stores nationwide we've done two we've done an acquisition we've done a licensing of another company we've organically developed opened another a third a fourth manufacturing company uh, we're selling in the likes of Macy's. We're selling in the likes of Bed Bath and Beyond. Again, 800 retailers nationwide. We're working with distributors nationwide. Uh, we're working with the San Francisco 49ers about possibly doing a, a, a promotion for the opening of their new building, Levi Strauss Stadium. I mean, just and again, it's because of this guy that we're doing these things, and we get that. But you know, what what could it? I can't remember the exact number, but is, is it 60% of companies when they face a catastrophic loss or issue such as we did go out of business? And instead of that, because of our, our folks, we didn't go out of business, we've actually grown. Hmm. And the opportunities before us are even much brighter. 
while we maintain our, our American-made hand craftsmanship and our attention to detail and, and, and the customer. Uh, Dave, I guess, you know, it was, uh, to have the Pittsburgh Penguins, you know, respected brand, National Hockey League, national following, stand behind this company in that sort of crisis, had to have played a big part. How much did you have to think about it? These guys have burned down. They are out of business. You've got a big game in a month. How, you know, what went through your mind and how quickly were you able to say, you guys need us to front you the money? And how were you able to make that decision? Well, I, I don't have a dog, so I couldn't kick the dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and a lot of, you know, we talk about Dave Soltes. I mean, as with Will, this is a we. It's, it's our marketing department. You know, it's the folks at the organization who would support you when you want to make a decision. You just lay the facts out, you know. Um, you have to trust people at some point in time in business. If you want to be aggressive, if you want to, if you want to make a mark in business, you have to take risks. You know, for us, the, the Penguins organization at the time, it was a risk, okay. Uh, a lot of things we do are risk. You know, I like to say 95, I did 200 things last week and 175 were right. So uh, sometimes we don't dwell on the negative, but you know, did we take a risk? Yes, we did. We took a risk because we believed in the organization. The decision was made on March 4th, but the, but the, the courtship happened long before that. You know, the order was placed on the 4th, but you know, it's meeting the folks, you know, seeing the drawings, seeing the capabilities, how quickly they responded to different things that we asked. Hey, I don't like this, how about this artwork? How about this picture, this different picture? So that, you know, that's what it's about. Yes, it was a tremendous risk on the organization. Probably would have lost my job, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, again, you know, you sit there, the organization never failed on delivering a promotion. We had that kind of faith in the Forge that they would deliver on what we said. You know, and they went through it. Hey, I talked, you know, and, and Christian, who was our sales guy at the time, said, hey, listen, I've talked to, I've talked to Will, you know, we're set up in a other place. The dies are safe. I just want to let you know it was constant communication. You know, we're going to work around the clock. This is the only project we're going to work on. So it's, it's you know, one thing we didn't talk about and it's so important. When you get into a labor man, it's about communication. You know, if I wasn't communicated to, you know, what was going on, I'd probably pull the promotion. But hey, Dave, you know, it was a day or so after. We, we saved it. We have them. We have another facility. We can start this up. We're really, really sure we can do it had some questions, you know, so this bang, bang, bang. So that's a type of relationship. You know, business isn't just, you know, dollars and cents, you know, and sometimes what's lost today is, is the relationship aspect. Of it. And, I, and I got to point to the, to the labor management aspect of it. You know, this works and works great because there's a relationship, you know. There's a respect, you know, of, of their, both of their position when it comes into that climate. A lot of years I was in the grocery business, I dealt in that environment with very, very tough labor unions at that point in time. And you have to understand, um, you know, it is about communication. It's been, it's been an interesting discussion. I think I've done all but one of these sessions. And, you know, you talk about labor management relations. You spend a lot of time talking about money. You spend time talking about benefits. You spend time talking about work rules. You may not talk as much about the customer as you should. I think that's one thing we've learned. But a lot of the conversation today has been about values. It's been about trust. It's been about communication. It's been about faith. And uh, I mean, Will, you're very upfront about this. You know, how much does your faith drive your philosophy in this business? And, and how much does it drive the whole mission behind uh, Wendell August? And, and, and what difference does, do you think that's made you know, for you, for your company, and for what all of you have been able to accomplish here? You know, my relationship with the Lord is central to everything I do. Um, again, I make mistakes, a lot of them, but I, I think the key thing I did post-fire and that I, the, 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 one of the key things that, that I have contributed to this uh, story is a sense of calm. And that wasn't just, that wasn't me. That was, again, I think the Lord had prepared me in unique ways, and I'd love to chat with some of you about how he had prepared me for, I don't know if any of you read the book of Esther, for such a time as this, she was called for such a time as this, the fire is raging, and I know at that moment that I was called for such a time as this. I knew it, I, 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 I knew it, and so my faith is central to everything I do. I, I have my jerk moments, 
for sure. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and we hope, you know, we try to, uh, to live biblical values uh, every day in our company, honoring people, um, honoring others above ourselves, um, you know, and, 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 and doing the right thing in the right way. And as Dave says, it's not about always the bottom line. We've got to create a bottom line to exist, but it's not always about that. And, and uh, I hope uh, in my failures that, that still people would see that from me, from Chris, from others, we have a, a set of values that really, if you look at the founding of our country, you know, the wholesomeness and goodness and belief in people we're founded on, and we try to, to live that out every day. And, and uh, hopefully the people I, I, I work with see that, and hopefully the folks we work with uh, as our customers see that as well. But it's definitely not me and me alone. This is, again, if there's, if there's nothing you leave with about Wendell August outside of this, is it's a great group of people with diverse talents that have come together and, and we're working together for a common purpose and a common good. All right. How about a round of applause for our panel? Great discussion tonight. Thank you. Have a couple of words before the reception. I'm rarely rendered speechless, but that story is, is pretty amazing. <clears throat> I'm often faced with temptation uh, <laughs> it's part of you allowing my hands to are here the, the, the <laughs> copper ticket hmm? that's sitting there the copper ticket is that one. ticket is for you oh no it's okay yeah <laughs> now okay. Let's just keep it. The, the other thing you have to realize that you know get into a little bit more which I'm, I'm sure these guys were going to mention is that each of these artisans, somewhere on the face of that ticket, hides their initials. So you, you see their stamp on the back, but somewhere in a tree or somewhere else in, on that, that art, no matter what it is from when it is, they're putting their identification on the piece, the particular artisan that did it. So that's why each of these pieces is so unique. It, they're almost like snowflakes. The hand, if you look at the edge, no two edges are hammered the same. Each craftsman. Oh, it sounds like a commercial for Wendell August. On yeah. <laughs> tape, right? Yeah. <laughs> I could do a commercial. <laughs> thank you all so much for for coming. Thank all of you for coming and for your participation. Um, Bob, thank you so much. It goes without saying. Bill, thank you for your moderation. Amy, thank you. Um, and it's an incredible story. It is an incredible company. I have a lot of things to go home and find stamps and initials on. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. And I hope you'll jo all join us in the back. Thank you. Thank you.